it is a kainos word. It's a new word, never heard in the earth, Lord. So we just thank you, God. We thank you for that, Father, that you're just releasing through him your kingdom to be established here in this place, in Oahu, and around the world, Lord. We just bless him, Father, in Jesus' name. Hi, everybody. Can I see hands again? Who was here at either of the morning services? Oh, great. Okay. I don't need to tell more stories or show you more videos. If you, if you want to know who I am and what I do, please go watch the morning services. Um, you'll hear some fun testimonies, some great stories about what God is doing out in the islands. Can you guys turn to your neighbor for a minute and tell them if you've ever been to Hawaii before? And if so, which island? Is anybody else stuck on Elvis Presley all of a sudden? Oh, that was so good. I'd sing it for you, but I don't know if you're ready for that. Hey, tonight's going to be a little more interactive, and I want to explain a few things. Um, I, I just want to say this again. I love SRC. You guys are great. This is, this is quickly becoming... One of our favorite spots. We've been here for all of three days, and it's grown real fast on us. Um, thank you for welcoming us like you have and for receiving what we carry so well. It, it's, such a, it's really a joy to be able to go into a house and not have to explain every little thing where people understand what you're talking about. And I can say things like Shekinah or, I don't know, sing Elvis Presley songs and people not storm out of here. Um, Let's agree with the Lord coming into tonight. And I want you to repeat after me. Are you ready? Say, God, I'm open to whatever you want to do tonight. I'm going to pursue whatever you're doing. Now look to your neighbor and tell them his glory is all over you. I want to break some mindsets tonight, and I'm going to take some liberties. I know Darren is coming home, so let's break, take all the liberties we can before Darren gets home. I don't know what the rules are on Sunday nights, but I want to break some mindsets about what church is supposed to look like. Yeah. Uh, hey, tech guys, is it possible to get this monitor turned off? Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, tech. Tech team rocks. Give it up for tech. We don't just clap hands. Church would be very, very different without tech people. They make this world go around. Church doesn't have to look a certain way. And like we talked about this morning, I, I want to ask you right off the bat, who did you come for? Jesus. Thank you. Yeah, good answer. Always answer Jesus. But I want you to actually position yourself to receive him tonight and to encounter him tonight. And this is something that we love to do in our ministry school at Kingdom Living, but also at our church at Reunion. And I want to invite you, let me explain this before everyone runs to the front. I want to open up the front tonight. And the reason is this, um, I need to give you permission to pursue the one. And I need to give you permission to come and sit in his presence and break your jar at his feet because a lot of us don't have that opportunity to respond to him like that in other environments. And I want to make sure that this is that environment for you tonight. And it doesn't matter what other people think. I can promise you nobody in the room is thinking about you. You're thinking about you. Everyone else just said they're here for somebody else other than you. But I want to tell you that your obedience will often bring breakthrough into the room. And the plan is this. As you guys come forward, pick a spot. Sit on the floor, lay on the floor, walk around the room. I don't care, but I'm going to have Rachel, um, just as she feels led, pray for different people in the room. And this is why I'm saying this, because if he stirs you, take an act of faith. If he's stirring you, why wouldn't you respond? 
Nobody cares and nobody's watching you, but you will lead the way for others' breakthrough. And as you encounter him, I felt like the Lord say this, a step of faith is required, but there's a reward attached to it. In, in other words, don't let yourself get stirred and then not respond. Don't let yourself, don't allow that to happen. And I promise you, you will not be a distraction for me. I don't care if you're pacing and doing cartwheels. It doesn't matter to me. But I need you to encounter him tonight and not some guest speaker from the other side of the ocean. Yes, he can meet you later at your house when no one else is watching. But again, if he's asking you to respond now, why would you wait till later? What's the point? Why wait? What's the reason? And I'm going to tell you, most of the time, the reason is fear. And especially in his house, we will not let fear dictate any part of our agenda. Nothing. It doesn't get to play here. And so my question is, what is he worthy of? What do you carry that only you can give him? What does he require from you? And again, I said this this morning, this is the only time in all of eternity that you can give him a sacrifice of praise. It's the only time that you can step out and take a risk for him. This is it. So at any point during the night that you feel him stirring you, come and sit, come and lay, come and rest. But I, I want to lay some ground rules. Let him move around and minister to you. Stay as long as you want. Come whenever you want. Go back whenever you want. There's no shame for not coming. People who come up are not more spiritual. And there isn't any prize for whoever stays the longest. Sometimes people think, I'm going to stay here the whole time. But if God says, hey, I want you to sit there for 10 seconds and turn around and come back to your seat, that's what he's asking you to do. And I want you to respond to that. This isn't a contest. And I'm, I'm being as serious as I can. I'm not impressed by people who come up. I'm not impressed by people who sit in their seats. I don't think God is. But what I think he's impressed by is heart. I think he's impressed by obedience. I think he's impressed by response to his beckoning and his calling. So if you feel a longing to come up here, just come be with him. And so that's the first thing I want to do tonight is just break mindsets in the room that this has to be like whatever it's supposed to look like. Christians love to tell other Christians what it should look like. And we say, quit shooting on people. <laughs> that, that's not allowed. This is a, actually a teaching moment because it's far more important for us to train our people how to minister to him than most of us give time and credit to. It's far more important for us to learn how to minister and discern what he's doing in the room and where his heart is gravitating than to listen to a sermon. Start asking him tonight what the burdens are on his heart and what the longings are on his heart. And he'll tell you, are you his sheep? Let me try this out. Are you his sheep? Yeah. yeah then guess what? You're going to hear his voice. And you know what? I promise you there's a good number of people where he's saying like, no, I don't want you to go to the front. There's a good number he's saying, yeah, come up here. So tonight... I think that it's more important for you to receive this message than it is for you to listen to this message, if that makes sense, because you're sitting under anointing, and the purpose is never to listen and admire, but especially for tonight, it's to take and receive. I don't want you to think about learning tonight. I want you to think about receiving things, and tonight's topic, glory, I think it's one of the most important topics there is, and it's one of those things in Christianity where we know the verbiage. We've, we've all heard this word hundreds, if not thousands of times. But there's certain words in our Christian vernacular that no one can really dial in on. So if I asked everybody, what is, what is anointing? There would be 200 different responses tonight as to what anointing is. Glory is one of those things. But what I want you to walk away with is this, is understanding why it's important and why does it matter. Biblically and throughout church history, I would say most of the time, God comes in ways that we don't expect, that we don't hope he comes, and honestly, in ways that we don't want him to come. Think about all the Bible stories that you can. Think about all the stories throughout church history. We can't use our offense as a test to see whether it's God or not. 
We love to say, oh, I'm offended. Therefore, it can't be God. I don't like that. God would never fill in the blank. Biblically speaking, offense was never used as a qualifier to see whether it was God or not. In fact, God often, most usually showed up in ways that offended minds and intellect. The, the people who were most offended by God, who were 100% sure that it wasn't him, were the same ones who crucified the Son of God. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the experts of the law, they didn't like the way that Jesus came and they said, I'm offended, this can't be God, let's kill him. I want you to just understand this fact about the Pharisees. This wasn't like getting into college where you write an essay to get in. This was something that they studied their whole lives to become. This is just to become a Pharisee, you had to memorize the first five books of the Bible, word for word. That, that was the entry test. And so they were trained their entire lives to look for the one, their Messiah. And when he showed up, because he came in a way that didn't fit in their preconceived notions or their boxes, they set out every day to kill him. They were so sure. The easiest way to offend religious folks is for God to show up. Because when he shows up, it usually doesn't make sense. So we cannot use offense as our litmus test. And this is, this sounds so basic and so foundational, but we have to learn to actually, actually recognize him. It's called discernment, and it's a spiritual gift. We have students every single year come through our ministry school and on the application to ask them what they feel like their strengths are, what they feel like they have giftings in. And I would say 70% of the students write the word discernment on their applications. And what I've learned to find is that many people think that they're operating in discernment when they're really operating in offense. They're, they're very discerning on what they like and what they don't like. And they're, they've become experts in discerning their preferences. There are certain words in Christianity that we don't want to over-intellectualize because part of God's nature is mystery. And some things shouldn't be cut and dry. I don't fully understand glory. I don't know if I even understand half of it. I can't give you a solid definition of it, but I've experienced it and it's changed everything. We're going to get pretty deep into scripture tonight. I'm going to keep James back there, busy as a bee. Can we go to Hebrews 1.3? This is talking about Jesus. It says he, Jesus, is the radiance of his glory, of God's glory. So, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. I need, to, I need you to keep that slide up there, and I want you to think about what this verse is actually saying. It's talking about God's glory. And look what it's actually saying. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. In other words, Jesus is the glory of God manifesting. We're going to talk about three different things that glory can be. There's many other things, but the three I want to highlight tonight um, the first one is this, is that glory can be overpowering. And we see this all throughout scripture. I'm only going to show you a couple, but it's everywhere. Um, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 8. It says, it happened that when the priest came from the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord. So that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. They couldn't minister because of glory that was invading. And that glory manifested as a cloud. This is where we get the term glory cloud. Go to Exodus chapter 40. Then the cloud covered the tent of the meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. 
For throughout all of their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. Do you see how glory can be overpowering? Now I want to point something out. In the old covenant, under the old covenant, glory, you could not enter the cloud. We just saw two passages. There's many more that talk about this. But in the new covenant, it says they walked into the cloud. On the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus met with Elijah and Moses, it said a cloud appeared, and they all, including the disciples, went into the cloud. So under the old covenant, glory overpowered you, but in the new covenant, you're invited into the glory. Yeah. Do you feel him? Do you, just, just, do you discern him? Yeah. Pay attention to him tonight. Real close attention. As if he's the reason why we came. I want to read you a very familiar passage out of John 18. It's the arrest of Jesus. And I, I don't know this, but I bet some of you have never noticed this part about this passage. It's John 18. It says, The Pharisees and the leading priests had given Judas a large detachment of Roman soldiers, or a Roman cohort, as some translations say, and the temple police to seize Jesus. Judas guided them to the garden, and all of them carrying torches and lanterns and armed with swords and spears. Jesus, knowing full well what was about to happen, went out to the garden entrance to meet them. Stepping forward, he asked, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. Now Judas, the traitor, was among them, and he replied, I am he. You just go to the next slide. Yeah, I am he. I want you to understand what actually happened in this passage. This was not a small group of soldiers that came after Jesus. I grew up in Sunday school with the felt background characters that you hung on there. And I remember Jesus, his three guys who, you know, were waiting in the garden, and then like six soldiers who showed up. A Roman cohort, if you don't believe me, Google it, is between three, 300 to 800 trained armed soldiers. Plus, there were other officers and chief priests and Pharisees, the temple police were there. This was not nice guys. This, this was the SWAT team of their day. And perhaps 800 of them show up to get this one man. The other gospels say that a great multitude came to arrest Jesus. And the verbiage in the Greek, it means massive, enormous crowd. They literally filled a hillside to come and arrest Jesus, perhaps a thousand men. And this is the part that I bet some of you have never seen. Let's go to verse 6. And the moment Jesus spoke the words, I am he, the mob fell backward to the ground. Think about what just happened to a thousand trained SWAT team soldiers. When Jesus said, I am he, he used the same language that God used when he encountered Moses at the burning bush. When he said, I am that I am. Tell them that the I am has sent you. When Jesus said, I am he, what he was saying is, I am God. And a hillside, this mob of angry soldiers encounters the glory of the Lord and it overpowers them. Glory can be overpowering. The next thing I want you to know about glory, it can be overpowering, but it can also be transferred. Glory can be transferred. The, the first and probably most well-known way is from God to man. God can give man glory. John 17, 22, this is Jesus speaking. He said, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them. Past tense. There's a transference. God, you gave me glory, now I've given it to them. I love this one, Exodus 34. It's talking about Moses. So Moses was there with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the word of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. And when Moses had finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. 
Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel as what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until, it, until he went in to speak with him. God transferred glory to Moses, and somehow it was absorbed by Moses. Isaiah 43, 7 says this, everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory. You were, car- you were created to carry glory. That means he gives it to you. It's not humility to say, oh, no, 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 I can't receive glory. You were designed for it. That's part of your job. So glory can be transferred from God to man, but it can also be transferred from man to God. Look at Isaiah 42. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise. That's not a metaphor. That's an actuality of giving him something tangible. And we're going to talk about the tangible nature of glory here in a minute. Psalm 115 verse 1 says, not to us, O Lord, but to your name we give glory. You can probably think of a million more times when it talks about giving glory to God. And we think that just means, oh, it means we're praising him. No, no, no. There's a tangible giving to him of something in our possession. We own it. Do you, do you understand why worshiping in spirit and truth is suddenly very important when we're talking about glory? There's an actual transference happening. And this morning, if you were here, you heard me talking about the throne that it actually creates him. So glory can be transferred from God to man, from man to God. But did you know that glory can also be transferred from man to man? Acts chapter 19. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. How else would you explain that? Acts chapter 5. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. That's at least. What's at most? Seriously, what was happening? Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. All of them. I want you to think about this, because we can rush through these Bible stories and just treat it like a story, but think about this. Why were people lining the streets when Peter came? Yes, we know it's to get in his shadow, but I don't think one day they just took a vote and said, hey, let's go stand on the side of the road and see if Peter's shadow touches us and maybe it will heal us. No, Peter was probably out doing normal things, and they noticed that wherever he went, if he got close to people, if his shadow touched them, Demons would come out. They would get off their mats. People would run around healed. And they probably thought, wherever this man goes, we have to bring the sick. We have to bring the lame. We have to bring the hurting. So that at least his shadow would just brush them. At least, at the very least, they're just going to get healed. What's at most? Listen, Paul's handkerchief, it wasn't a magical handkerchief. There wasn't unicorn fur and pixie dust involved with this. What do you think got transferred through that handkerchief? The glory of God. This is a real thing. Peter's shadow wasn't magical. There was something on or in that shadow that actually transferred to people and kicked out darkness. If it can absorb in skin, in Moses' face, why can't it absorb in cloth? One of the most famous passages in scripture talks about that. The woman with the issue of blood. She comes to Jesus. She never touches Jesus. She touches his garment. And what happens to her? She's healed. Jesus says, I felt something transfer out of me who touched me. What do you think he felt leaving him? Some some translations say he felt virtue. Whatever we want to call it, the glory of the Lord hit that woman because she touched infected cloth. I heard someone very recently, I just caught the tail end of a conversation as I was walking by and they said, they're trying to do everything to get us. And my thought was, so is God. He is doing everything to try to get us. I don't understand any of this stuff intellectually, but my lack of understanding doesn't make it less true. 
It doesn't give me a hall pass from embracing it. Okay. In other words, offense cannot be the test to see whether this is God or not. Because I don't understand it. But I want it. I want it. Glory can be overpowering. Glory can be transferred. And the third thing I want to point out about glory is that it can transform our very being. 2 Peter chapter 1. And because of his glory and excellence, say glory. Because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share in his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Take a look at that verse. That is mind-blowing because it says, because of his glory and excellence, we have promises that enable us to do two things. The first is that we are enabled to become like God. It says we share in his divine nature. The second thing it says is that it gets us out of sin. Do you understand why glory is starting to become important to us? 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. What makes us look like him? His glory. Beholding his glory actually transforms us into his image. So that we can share in his divine nature. You know, they call us Christians for a reason. It means little Christ. That means when people see us, they should say, is that Jesus walking around? Because, man, his shadow's healing people. Demons can't be in the same room. When he comes in a room, joy enters with him. Hope and light and life come with him. Listen, if we behold him, the expectation is that we start to look like Jesus. That's the expectation. We become like what we behold. We become like what we focus on. Where you give your attention, you will become like that. Remember, don't put this back up there, Hebrews 1.3, where it said that Jesus is the glory of God, right? And when we behold the glory of God, we are beholding Jesus. And when we behold Jesus, we become like him. That's a good deal. I just have to look at him, and I become like him. Scripturally speaking, whenever God gives us his names, it's always two things. His names are always his nature and promises. In other words, it tells us who he is and what he does. Not just what he does sometimes, but what he always does, because that's who he is. You cannot separate him from his, from his name. So if he says, my name is Jehovah Jireh, what is Jireh? Provider. I'm Jehovah Provider. That means that's who I am. It's my DNA to provide. I am God the provider. It's what I love to do. It also means that it's a promise. That it's like, God, I don't know what to do. I need you to provide. He says, oh, that's great. That's who I am. It's a promise. Sure, I will come through for you. Anytime you see a name of God, it's his nature and it's a promise. Did you know that one of God's names is glory? Let's look at 2 Peter 1.17. From when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. When he comes, when he comes, according to the Bible, certain things always come with him. Angels always come with him. They surround him. If you see angels, you're close to God. Healing always comes with him. It's on his wings. It's his name. It's who he is. That's what he likes to do. It's his promise. Peace comes because he's the prince of peace. Comfort comes because he's the comforter. Glory comes because he is the majestic glory. Glory is important. It's a telltale sign that God is here. He comes, he brings his glory, and it makes us like him. Are you guys okay? In the old, or sorry, in the Bible, there's two different words used for glory. Um, in the Old Testament, it's written in what language? Hebrew. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for glory is kabod. You can put that picture up there. 
It's used about 200 times in the Old Testament, and there's a short definition. It means to be physically heavy, weighty, or burdensome. So think about all those moments we read about glory being overpowering. It uses this word, the kabod of the Lord, the heaviness, the weight, the burdensome nature of God. Here's a longer definition of kabod. Go to that next slide. Abounding, becoming fierce, becoming heavy, burdensome, glorious, serious, momentous, growing strong, heavy, holding in honor, multiply, weigh heavily, went heavily. I want to tell you that the glory of God is tangible. You know this because you felt it. We felt it this morning when we walked into the room. There is a substance and a weight, and it's the kabod of God. This isn't Christianese. It's not us pretending. No, it's, it, it's literally who he is. He's the majestic weight, heaviness. In the New Testament, which is written in what language? Mostly Greek. There you go. Uh, the Greek word for glory is doxa. It's used about 167 times. Here's a short definition. Glory, honor, praise, dignity. Longer definition of doxa. Praise, honor, glory, splendor, brightness, majesty, a most glorious condition, a most exalted state, judgment, renown, the unspoken manifestation of God. If God's presence cannot be separated from glory, and if it's his nature to have glory, if it's his promise to give glory, shouldn't Christians have some level of familiarity with the glory of God? Yeah? Unfortunately, in a lot of circles, the glory has been absent for so long that when it does appear, they think it's the devil. It hasn't been there, and it, it, we lose the ability to recognize it. One of the things that we're continually told about our ministry school, Kingdom Living, is the heaviness in the room. When people come in, even to our classroom, they say, I, God is here. I feel his presence. And when people say that, let's, let's take the metaphor out of that. We're being very literal. I feel the weight of his glory. There's probably people in here tonight who feel the weight of his glory. It's because he's the majestic glory. And when he comes, there's heaviness. Can you recognize his glory? Because it's not automatic. People think everyone would recognize it if they experienced it. But the Pharisees couldn't. The Roman cohort couldn't, even after it knocked them off their feet. Isaiah 6.3 says that the whole earth is full of his glory. Present tense. That means there's glory for the taking. Not future glory, but here and now glory. And let me rephrase that. Here and now on Sunday, June 12th glory. Do you know why some people can be in an environment? Oh, just turn your hearts down. Turn your affections to him. Do you know why some people can be sitting there encountering the glory of the Lord and the person next to them is bored out of their minds wondering when church is going to get over? Do you know why? It's the same reason It's the same reason that Jesus produced 11 world changers and one person who sold his soul for 30 pieces of silver. It's not on him, it's on us. That's why. He the whole earth is full of his glory. He's not going to force it on you. He is glory and it comes with him and the difference is those who seek it. Those who actually prioritize gazing upon him and lavishing him with worship and ascribing worth to him and value to him. This is why we celebrate him, the majestic glory, whether we feel him in the room or not. Because we don't go by our feelings. I love my feelings. My feelings are great, but I can't go by them. 
I love the chills. I love the tingles. But if I don't have those, it's, it's wrong for me to assume that nothing's happening. One of my dear friends, he's on our board of directors for our, our nonprofit. His name's Jonas. I love him. He's like a hero of mine. And this is a guy who we've had so much life together. And one of the things he's told me is that he said, Sam, I wish I could feel God. People are feelers. Like, I'm a feeler. I feel when he comes in the room. I feel when he presses in. And he said, Sam, I never, ever feel him. And when he told me that, it blew my mind because I want to tell you about Jonas. I want to be like Jonas when I grow up. He is radical. Jonas, uh, he's Swedish, and this was probably 25 years ago. They had a revival at his tiny little church in the woods of Sweden, middle of nowhere, I think they had 150 people on a good day. And God started moving, and it started in their youth group. And the things that God was doing got so, in a good way, out of control that Jonas ended up being on European national news multiple times just to tell them about what God was doing at his church. Think about that. Okay? Tiny little church in the middle of nowhere. And Jonas was actually the youth pastor at the time, and what would happen is he said, Sam, the presence of the Lord was so heavy and thick in the room that we actually had to limit saying the name Jesus, because when I would say it, literally 200 youth would fall out under the presence of God. And listen, this is funny to us, but it wasn't funny to Jonas, because he would have to put them over his shoulders, carry them home, and explain to their parents that they weren't drunk. They hadn't been given drugs, that they had actually encountered the Lord. This happened for years, years. And this, this, there's so much more. I'll have to tell you all these stories next time. Long story short, Jonah said through the whole thing, I never once felt God. But he said, I couldn't go by my feelings. I knew he was there. I had to celebrate what he was doing, whether I felt him or not. We looked at this verse earlier, John 17, 22. Jesus said, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. Again, the first thing I want to show you with this verse is that we have glory. You can't make your own glory, but you can receive glory from him. How else are we expected to give glory to God if we don't carry glory? You can only give away what you carry. The second thing I want you to notice about this verse is that glory unifies. It united Jesus with his father, and he says it's what unites us with each other. Now, listen, if we're not pursuing the glory, guess what doesn't happen? Unity. People wonder, wow, I'm just, we can't seem to connect with our people, with with other churches. I know why. Glory. Glory is important. I want to read you um, a paragraph from Randy Clark. He wrote something that I just, it, it's so beautiful. He calls it revealed. How does God reveal his glory in the world? The Bible contains 18 categories of instances where the glory of God is mentioned. And by far the largest category is miracles and healings, where God's glory is connected 30 times to demonstration of his power through the working of signs and wonders and miracles. Based on this fact, we can say that the main way God reveals his glory is through signs, wonders, and miracles. And this puts a new perspective on the phrase, don't touch God's glory. Are we not in some way robbing God of his glory when we hold on to a cessationist view of God's continued activity in the world? Jesus explicitly stated that God's will for us is to bring him glory. And the emphasis was clearly related to doing the works Jesus himself had been doing. Jesus didn't do the signs and wonders and miracles to authenticate the message. They were used to validate what he said. They were used as an expression of the message. I want to read you a verse, and I want to see if you can guess the context. We've probably all heard this verse, but what is actually happening? What Bible story is happening? It's John 1140. 
Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Do you know what Jesus did right after this? He raised Lazarus from the dead. In other words, Jesus was saying, this is what the glory of God looks like. And a dead man got out of the grave. Or how about this? Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine, John 2, verse 11. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. First thing I want you to note, this was the first of his signs which revealed his glory. His signs revealed his glory. The second thing I want you to note is this revealing of glory caused the disciples to believe. Second Corinthians 3. Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory that lasts? The implication of this passage is that you and I are carrying something far more glorious than Moses' glory. The glory that caused his face to shine. And Jesus explicitly stated that God's will is for us to bring him glory. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness over the people, but the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears, after, uh, appears over you. Can you repeat after me? His glory is upon me. Not in heaven, not later, not tomorrow. His glory is upon you. It fills the earth currently. Exodus 33. Moses said, if your presence doesn't go with us, don't lead us up from here. How then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are on the face of the earth? I want to pause on this thought. Moses is saying essentially like, your glory has to come with us. Your presence has to be with us. We need to be marked so that people know that we're your people. Most of us would say, because right before this, God said, I'm just going to send an angel with you, Moses. And he said, no, that's not enough. I, I, that's great, but I need your presence. Don't send us without your glory. God's people from the beginning have been marked by glory. Literally. From the beginning, from the Garden of Eden, God came and walked with Adam and Eve. If you saw that, you would know they were with God. Cain was marked by God, right? The Ark of the Covenant, where God's literal manifest presence was, it was marked by clouds. It was either a cloud by day or fire by night. Moses' face was shining. He was marked by God. In the New Testament, it says that his people are marked by tongues of fire. People knew who God's people were. Modern history tells us that God has always marked his people. The first and second great awakenings are astounding. If you ever stop and read what happened during those times, they were actually called the great clamor because it got so wild and woolly. And during these great awakenings, there would be ships coming to the new world who are miles offshore, and they would encounter a glory cloud, not fog, but this, this glorious haze that would come upon ships and crew members, sailors, prisoners would fall under this glory and start crying out, what must I do to be saved? Because they encountered the glory. Azusa Street, Asbury College, Brazil, all over the world. We've, we've, seen, we've had different people see fire and glory clouds over our building at Kingdom Living. And, and let's look at the flip side of that. How many of you guys have ever heard stories about people who used to be witches or warlocks who they would go into hospitals and they would actually be able to see who the Christians were 
because there was glory resting on them. And I've heard stories about these witches laughing at the Christians because the Christians didn't understand the power and authority that they actually had. God's people are always marked by his presence. Always. Are we marked? Because it's available. And when people encounter us, do they get us or do they get Jesus? I don't want to give the world someone who knows about Jesus. I want to give the world someone who's been gazing at him. Our expectations have been far too long for far too low for far too long. We have to raise the expectancies. We have to. I, this is just my opinion. I think that worship is the number one way that we can release worship or release glory. I think that there is just so much value to worship that we don't even understand. And when it comes to Christianity and to church culture, we cry out, God, send us more people. We need more volunteers. We need more classes. But what we need to be crying out for is a greater measure of glory. We need to be calling out for a greater measure of him. Because then we'll be like him. Then we'll share in his divine nature and escape sin. You were created to encounter him. You were created to carry glory. And we get to ask for glory. People think this is like pride. No, no, no. This isn't pride. This is me being how he's designed me to be. Ask him for more glory. You don't think that the majestic glory wants to give you more of himself? He's not going to give you a snake. He's not going to give you a stone. How much more will he give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask? There are no limits with him. We have as much of him as we want. We have to be intentional with prioritizing his presence. We have to be intentional with prioritizing his glory. He's so precious, guys. He's the darling of heaven. There isn't anything else we need to do tonight. There isn't any other goal. There isn't any other agenda. I love talking to you guys, but I I honestly feel, I have more notes, but I just feel like, why? Why? He's, He's better than notes. I don't care how you do it. Give him your affections. Ask for his glory. Ask for the majestic glory. Welcome him to your heart, to your life. This isn't, this is not fun and games. This is everything. This is everything. I don't know what's more important than glory because he is glory. Too many times we're in a rush, and I understand it's Sunday night. It's getting late. I want to get you guys out of here. You've got kids downstairs. You've got jobs tomorrow. But I I just feel like him saying just a a little bit longer. If you could see the significance of what you're doing right now, the value to him that this is worth.
I just proclaim that this is a house of his glory, that this is a resting place for glory. Not just omnipresent God, but kabod God. Weighty God. And I give you permission, I give you what he's given to me, that his weight will become so real to you that you can't escape it. I think some of you are going to go home tonight. You're going to lay down in bed and think you're having heart palpitations. But I'm telling you, he's pressing in. He's pressing in. When we sing, my beloved, the fairest among thousands and thousands, did you know that's what he's singing over you? You're his beloved. We're not his slaves and his soldiers. He says, no longer do I call you slaves. We're actually his bride. There's an intimacy that comes with being a bride that doesn't come from being a slave, doesn't come from being a disciple. And he crosses mountains and oceans just to hear his beloved's voice. My beloved is the fairest among thousands and thousands. And he's looking at you. I want to honor you guys and, and let you go if you need to go, because like I said, it is late, but I, we're going to keep the service going a little longer. If people want to just sit and receive from him, that's really important to us. And um, if you do need to leave, this is the official dismissal. We love you. Thank you for being here. Can't wait to see you again. Um, but I would ask very humbly, very humbly, that you would just protect this environment, that any conversation happens out there. I don't want to interrupt him and his beloved. Do we have any house music we can put on? Just, uh, I want people to feel um, a freedom to receive him, whether it's in your seat. There's nothing magical about coming to the front. There's nothing magical about staying in the front. There's also nothing magical about staying in your chair. If you feel like you want to receive more from him, come on up to the front. We'll have uh, the SRC ministry team. You guys can jump in and pray. Me and Rachel will pray for you guys. But I just really feel like there's a grace Shh.